So last week we talked um, uh, about a lot of stuff. And when I got to the end, I said of my presentation, I thought the U.S. stock market was going to have a bit of a pullback and consolidation period to continue like we've been in, but we we're going to end the year up at higher levels. And I think Michael Hammer asked how, why, but did I think that? And I wanted to dive into that a little bit more. So I want to make the case for U.S. equities today. There is a lot of things going on that are headline risks for the global economy and for the U.S. economy. I'm not saying the U.S. is the only market or the best market or will be the best re performing market. But I think from a risk reward perspective, I think it offers some of the best opportunities today. And I want to get into a little bit as to why. Um, but I want to start by looking at some of the other economies and some of the other challenges and uh, then get into um, why for ARS, we believe that the fundamentals for security valuation for the U.S. are favorable. And we use the outlook for inflation, interest rates and corporate profits as the determinants of security valuation and for us. While there are companies that look um, pricey in this environment, um, we do think overall the opportunity to make money in the U.S. market is on a risk reward basis is quite strong. And we'll talk about why there are other areas you could do and go for higher returns, but I think the risks that go with that are not necessarily worth the, uh, the challenge. So we'll jump right into it. I think there are several things that separate the U.S. and the rest of the world. But when we step back, the strength of an economy is, uh, is really reflective in the strength of their currency. As we know, the dollar has been one of the strongest currencies in the world for some period of time. It remains the world's uh, reserve currency, but we have a lot of other strengths that are kind of historical strengths of, of the U.S. What we have, probably the, we have the deepest, most liquid and most mature capital market system in the world. And that's something we take for granted, but um, but we do see it, and I'll show you later how capital continues to flow to the U.S. from that. We've done massive stimulus in the U.S. and um, put big future spending commitments out that are going to drive our economy forward um, for some time, and that's going to continue to support uh, a select number of companies and areas inside the market for some period of time. But don't forget, from the pandemic forward, we put over 50% of GDP in the form of fiscal and monetary stimulus towards the U.S. economy. And then we added to that with some of the uh, recent acts under the Biden administration to take it even to a higher level of that. So the strength of the economy is in large part due to the stimulus that's raised the deficits and all that. Um, but we are, are, are pushing uh, forward in a material way there. I also think there are geographic strengths that we have um, that continue to push us forward. I think our ability to be energy independent is a major asset. And if you don't feel that way, try doing business in Europe right now, or particularly in some of the uh, countries like Germany, where you're so heavily reliant on uh, uh, resources from other areas where you can do it internally in the US is a big advantage. Um, the fact that the industrial policies we put in place continue to push capital to the U.S. are another big part of it. But I think the other big element is we have the leading companies and leading innovators uh, in so many areas in, in, in the U.S. economy that are, are really important for the global economy. And that's actually a, a key element of that, starting with our big tech champions. Um, I also think, and this has screwed me up for, for the early stages following the, um, the inflation coming down and why I thought it might come down faster and, and even more uh, get to the 2% level faster, was I thought the U.S. consumer was drying up. And really, it's starting to um, show the, the inequality exists today, but the boomers are driving the economy, and boomer bucks are a big part of it. They have now where $75 trillion of wealth will be transferred from the boomers to the next generation. Uh, uh, Nine trillion of that will go to spouses um, first. Um, so you will have a lot of money moving, but the boomers uh, right now, 56% of them are retired. And as they move into retirement, they are spending on services, not goods. So they're starting to downsize some of their homes and starting to make that shift. But think about it, you still have, uh, 
you know, 44% that are, are going to retire over the next seven years. And that'll be another boost to consumption as they make their shifts. And further behind that is the fact that you have a Fed put potentially uh, that could increase multiples, um, although I don't think it'll be as much as the market's expectation is. So let's jump into it and look around the world and uh, bring it back to the U.S. and say why we think this is going to be the most attractive place to invest on a risk-reward basis. So China's got their problems. We know their real estate problems. They have stock market problems. They have consumption problems, and their economy is still imbalanced to uh, too much on an export-driven uh, economy, which is getting a lot of pushback from the U.S. and Europe on tariff concerns. And at the same time, you have a lack of uh, strength from the consumer to drive it. So it's imbalanced. Uh, it's creating a lot of frustrations, and some of the economic challenges are starting to lead to uh, more and more uh, uh, dissatisfaction from the population. And that's a big issue for President Xi and, and Chinese leaders is social stability is critical. So they are starting to lower rates. They're starting to do things to support the local governments to try and get the, uh, the economic mechanism moving forward again, but they have a big hole. There's an estimated seven to, to $11 trillion of debts in their local governments that are questionable as to what inside that is going to be good and good to be repaid going forward. And a lot of this is reflected in their stock market. As you can see, the China total return uh, for the market for the year to date, this is as of Friday, was down about 26%, I'm sorry, down 13%. And for the one year, it's down about 20%. So uh, investors there are getting the double whammy of real estate values coming down, stock market values coming down, and you add to it, wages are not growing as fast as they'd like across the board, and you have a lot of uh, youth unemployment still high. So clearly the challenges abound there, but I think China's recognizing them, starting to work through them. The question is, how long is it going to take to move back? And can they make the transition to more of a balanced economy? At the same time, tariffs are being threatened by the U.S. and by Europe, two of their biggest trading partners, and will they get enough business out of their uh, uh, allies in the autocratic nations to drive them forward or not? I think these are real questions in, in terms of the China market. Uh, I think people were underwhelmed by their recent uh, uh, economic event that they had, and a lot of the hope was for a big bang to stimulate the economy, and it doesn't look like they're going to take that approach. They're going to play the long game uh, deal with some of the problems and kind of work through the issues without making, I think, some of their existing challenges worse. But that doesn't mean that that's a place that's going to uh, attract a lot of capital. And in fact, they do are, are seeing capital outflows in China right now. India has been a hot topic for the last couple of years, and their new budget is a reflection of where many nations are putting their priorities, infrastructure and defense. India's really played the uh, East-West uh, divide or the democratic automation divide quite well to their benefits. I think Modi's done a, a pretty effective job in managing both sides against the middle for the best benefit for his country. Um, and it's played out. Their stock market has done it uh, quite well, as you can see from the chart. Year to date, it's up 24% through Friday. For the one year, it's up 45%. Um, so very strong returns. But I think there is some fragility in the system that makes it a more difficult place to invest. There are people on the call who are more expert on this than I am, but it's not an area that we play in on a regular basis. But I think a lot of the things that India has been doing under Modi are really helpful. But I think the core problems still exist around getting the infrastructure right, getting the energy right, dealing with some of their inequalities and some of their other more domestically oriented challenges. At the same time, there is a great education system. There's a lot of wealth and there is some... Uh, uh, corporate leaders that can drive things forward there. So I think it's another area to invest in. But again, on a risk reward basis, you have to balance how much would you put in a domestic portfolio in the US and Europe into India. I think it's not a place you'd want to run away from, but I also think it's a place you want to weight appropriately in portfolios. Brings us back to the ECB and some of their challenges and inflation is coming down, but 
it's coming down slowly and they're not projecting that the ECB will hit their inflation target till the second half of next year, which makes the outlook for rate cuts a little more, uh, a little less friendly for equity investing there as uh, the market might hope. I think one of the challenges is that uh, it's labor costs that are driving inflation. It's not corporate greed um, or profiteering from the pandemic. And what you can see is these unit labor costs are playing through. And we talked about this back at the beginning of the year, that in Europe, about 40% of the negotiated wages have not been uh, gone through contract yet. And they were coming through either in the fourth quarter of last year or in the first half of this year, which means those wage increases for union workers are going to be coming through where they could see 20% increases up front and then four or 5% increases over the next couple of years hitting the system. And that's actually creating some strains. As you can see from here, the wage uh, tracker is saying that they're going to see four or 5% Wage growth, um, while they're not seeing that kind of economic growth, you saw the numbers from Europe up about three tenths of a percent for the uh, recent uh, report for the uh, Germany. It was down one tenth of a percent for the month. Those are not the numbers you're looking for to get the kind of growth rates you need to offset some of the wage and inflationary effects. And if we have a big push up in energy, which we're getting the benefit from energy prices retreating right now, but if you have that push going into the second half of the year, Europe could be experiencing more challenges. And I just looked at the German stock market and up year to date, it was up about 5%. For the one year, it's up about 5%. Um, but the challenges abound still in Europe. And I think the FTSE is a little bit better. I think it was up around 9 10% through Friday, uh, but still lagging uh, what you're getting in the US and, and uh, other markets as well. So back to the US, we popped a pretty surprising uh, uh, GDP number for the Q2 at 2.8%. That's a pretty healthy number that you can uh, see uh, coming through. That surprised a lot of people. It takes some of the pressure off the Fed to cut rates. At the same time, their core PC number came in a, bit, a little bit higher than the market was expecting. Again, about a 2.6% rate. Um, so trending the right way, but certainly the battle's not won there uh, for, the, for there. So you're not seeing uh, a big uh, push down in rates, but trending down in rates is, is uh, existing. But I think the big issue that uh, is really underappreciated, and we've talked about this in the past, we're seeing big foreign direct investment coming into the U.S. over the last couple of years um, to companies and bring money onshore or creating new plants and factories or nearshoring. But now you're also seeing foreign investments, strong demand coming into the U.S. equity markets. And it's not just the equity markets. You're seeing strong demand from uh, other than China and Germany, which is, uh, I'm sorry, China and Japan, which you see on the top here, where China's really brought their treasury holdings down quite a bit. Um, but then you see other countries starting to rise up quite a bit, the UK picking up their numbers. So other foreign nations besides uh, China and India, I'm sorry, China and Japan, are increasing their holdings of treasuries. And we're now up to $35 trillion of treasuries outstanding. Uh, in the U.S., so the, the under the $2 trillion that China and Japan hold are much less impactful than they were back in uh, the early 2000s or even at the great financial crisis where there are much more meaningful players there. So I think this is a really interesting dynamic of who's going to buy the treasuries if China and Japan are selling. I think you're seeing it's coming from other nations, and that's actually surprised a lot of people. And that is good for the Treasury because it will help keep rates from being pushed up too much uh, as we do have big financing needs for the U.S. So I got back to the three determinants of security valuations. So we think inflation's coming down, but it's not going to get down as fast as as the market would like to get multiple expansion. But look at what corporate profits have done uh, since 2000. So they continue to move. They're supported by CapEx, which continues to push up. And it's not just the corporate CapEx, but you have the federal government and state and local governments 
also pushing CapEx spending or, or uh, stimulus spending going. And it's the combination of, of the federal government, local governments, and our corporations spending at record levels that continue to push our economy forward and fill in some of the gap of the weakening consumer that I think the market is underappreciating and why we continue to flirt with new highs in the markets here. And we think that uh, while there's going to be a lot of noise with the election and all that and the threats of Trump and the, and the policies of Harris that are still, still being determined, I think when you get back to it, what drives the market is the outlook for interest rates, inflation, and corporate profits. And we think inflation is going to be down. We think interest rates are going to be trending slowly but favorably down uh, with a Fed cut or two, but not as many as the market thinks. And we do see strong CapEx and strong corporate earnings continuing to move up with profits continuing to rise. And as companies get more on the bandwagon of improving productivity, you'll see corporate profits and corporate earnings continue to do better. That may push up in the unemployment rate, put more pressure on the Fed to ease, which will then give you more multiple expansion. And the question isn't, is the Fed going to cut? It's going to be, when do they do it and how much? And do they get politicized, caught up in the in the election policies? Because Trump wants lower rates, but he wants it only after he gets uh, after the election. I don't think the Fed's going to care one bit of one way or the other. I think they'll do 25 in September, and the betting markets have it at almost 100 percent odds that they do it then. Um, I think this capex is a big driver. I do see some slowing in capex. But the rich continue to do what they need to do to spend. I think it's the companies that are the other forced 493 in the S&P that a mix of them, some of them cannot afford to increase their CapEx. Therefore, they will not likely improve their productivity and they'll be left behind. And that narrows the field of where the real investable opportunities are going to be. Uh, in the market. I think it's going to be very tough for those with low growth, high debt, and increasing debt servicing costs to make the, the transitions to improve their productivity. And I think they will not make the technology investments needed to grow the way they can grow and compete effectively. So we talked about the Fed. This is what the look is for December. We're at 525 to 550 right now. And as you can see, they're expecting uh, the CME market expectations are much more aggressive. I would be surprised if we get there that fast. If we do, I think we'll have other problems that we don't want to uh, have to contemplate. But in normal economic activity for what we see going forward, I think this is where the market thinks we're going to be. I think they might be somewhat disappointed um, in the aggressiveness of the Fed because I think there is going to be growing concern that other issues are going to weigh on the economy that will slow some of the economic activity uh, down and maybe not have the Fed move quite as much as they need to. Um, I think for all the positives of the U.S., I don't want to be Pollyannish about it. We do have a lot of problems. We have a imbalance in the in the uh, market, and we also have uh, some debt and deficit issues that we can't ignore. And neither of the politicians that look to be the leaders uh, going forward have policies in place that will do anything but expand the deficits, in my view, um, and increase spending and not do much for revenue. Um, so I think we're going to be in a mode where that's going to be an overhang, but I think the near-term issues post-election will drive the market up. I think in the, inter in the intermediate time, we'll be treading water and seeing the kind of volatility that we've seen over the last month or so. Um, I think the election will have a lot of swings between uh, now and uh, November 6th. I think one of the key issues that you have to keep in mind is um, you had a big lift for Trump following the uh, Republican convention. Then when Harris uh, was uh, assumed to be the presumptive uh, candidate for the Democrats, you saw a big lift for her. But now the reality is going to set in that we have the end of earnings season, and then we're going to start to see what the policies are going to be, who the vice president vice presidential candidate will be for the Democrats. And then you'll see the missteps that these guys make between now and the election. And you'll see a lot of volatility too then. But after that, we'll get back to the normal course of business. And I think we'll, we'll be moving forward in a much more effective way. And uh, election years tend to do quite well after the election anyway. And I think the setup is actually pretty good going into that. 
Despite the recent pullback, the S&P is still in an uptrend, and uh, I think we could see some more downside in the near term, but uh, mainly from uh, the FANGs. But I think the expectation for the market that the FANGs have this massive pullback continuing and that the rest of the mar- everyone's going to rotate to the rest of the market, I think, is flawed. I think the discussion we're having at the start of the call where the FANGs are getting better discipline, and we use the example of uh, Alphabet and what they're doing, putting that discipline in place, I think is what's going to drive the FANGs to continue to do well, Uh, maybe not as well as they have been, uh, but continue to do well for the market. And then you'll have the rest of the market doing better um, for a percentage of the other 493. I don't think all 493 will do well, but I think that's going to continue to lift the U.S. up and put us in good standing going forward. So I think we have a very strong economy still. I think inflation is slowing. I think inflation are coming down, but uncertainty continues to rise, mainly around the election and the potential policies coming out of that. Um, As I said, it is almost impossible anywhere in the world to find somebody running, a candidate running on a platform of discipline, which means the inflation concerns that you're hearing from some of the ECB uh, governors are real. I think in the U.S., we're thinking that we need to cut rates more. Uh, You heard uh, John Williams, the former New York Fed, reverse his view on that. I don't see that, and we haven't, as for those who've listened, we haven't been in the camp that the Fed needs to do as much as the market needs to do. And a lot of that comes to the fact that we do have debt servicing concerns. We have who are going to be the buyers, and while we do have these new buyers coming in, if you continue to issue 8 to $10 trillion of debt that has to be refinanced, that's a lot of buyers, so uh, you need to have uh, reasonable rates for that. I think the yield differential of the U.S. and the rest of the world is uh, developed world is continues to attract capital our way, which will help us with the bond markets. But I definitely think you're in a period where you want to look at the guys with the free cash flow and the strong balance sheets to do the funding, to fund their future growth initiatives, to be keeping up with AI, to be keeping up with hiring the best and the brightest, and to making the transition to improve productivity around the companies requires spending. And if all your money is going to debt servicing costs, you're not going to be able to make that transition. I think we're in, we've been in an oversold position, then we got into an overbought position recently where the bullish sentiment has gotten to extreme levels. I think that augurs a period where you have a little bit of pullback or consolidation uh, that will probably run through the election. There are continued to be uncertainties, both domestically and globally, um, that will work through. But um, I think the next two months are traditionally challenging for the markets. Uh, but we'll see a rally as we move into the rest of the year. So, Mark, I'm going to stop there and open up for uh, opposing views and uh, and other areas people see opportunities. Thanks, Stephen. You're welcome. Question, question of Adams off to the races, then Bill. Good morning, Stephen. Great presentation. Thank you. The, the capital expenditures chart that you had, what is the nature of those the capital expenditures? Are these new factories? Are these upgrades in machinery? Is it technology? I have a chart from previous presentations that I didn't use today, but it showed that over half of the CapEx now is on IT and IT-related stuff in the U.S. So people are going to productivity now. It's all going to be about how do you find the ways to lower your costs and to be more efficient um, to deal with both labor shortages uh, as well as wage increases that are really squeezing companies. And it's not just in the tech area. Um, I was talking to somebody who is a very big franchise uh, guy in uh, the food services business. He runs uh, uh, probably a hundred million dollars or more of uh, uh, gross revenues in in the food in the in that business. And his big push is uh, with minimum wages going up, is replacing workers with uh, automation as fast as he can. So you will see kiosks be for all your ordering in those places. Um, you'll see different elements of uh, uh, automated process automation going through to lower costs and keep the the headcounts down. 
and it's going to be in the in virtually every area. You're seeing it in the hospitality industry as well. Hotels are changing how their staffing works. I think all the industries are doing that. It's who has the money to do it that can afford to make those transitions and who, who makes the right bets on their capex spend. But it's a lot of it's around productivity. Yeah. We're seeing that in finance as well. JP Morgan's set up a AI bot for the researchers in-house. Yeah. So seeing a lot of that as well. Thank yep. you. And you're gonna try and wipe out middle middle management wherever you can. So if you're a middle manager, start looking at other skills. Upgrade yourself. Yep. I think Bill's next, Mark. Bill next. Yeah, so um, a, a, a quick question, and then uh, I've got a, a reinforcing comment uh, following that. So yeah, see, this is this is really interesting. Um, going back to the uh, the Treasury uh, chart on that one, I noticed that the UK was like really increasing their purchases, uh, which I thought was interesting. Do you do you have any any thoughts on on that? Yeah, would you? If, would you would you want to be a holder of UK debt with their situation today? <laughs> I get. I think I really. I mean, we think about it. I, I say that kind of in a flip comment, but not really. Like that's the choice, right? No, you're right. When, and when I go back to why do I think the US is the most attractive market? I think it is on a risk reward basis, and we often just look at the reward and not the risk. And I think that's the, really the issue that we're facing is how many of these economies are struggling with finances that will make it very hard for them to not increase taxes or regulation or other things that are going to squeeze the ability of, of companies and the government to deliver. And, I, and we've talked about most governments are in terrible financial shape. The U.S. is as well. That's why I wanted to show the deficits here. But the ability to get out of that is going to be very difficult for a lot of these countries. I think the UK is starting to maybe come out of the doldrums, but what are the policies going to be of the new government and will they be enough to move the needle? And I, I don't see that in a lot of nations. Right. So I think that's the challenge. And I think when you look at the assets and liabilities of countries uh, and you did a balance sheet analysis on it, the US has the better balance sheet um, from uh, from what the potential is than other countries. And I think that's really the challenge. Right. Yeah, certainly yeah, I, the interest rate differentials are in our in our favor. And to your point, you know, risk return is clearly in our favor on that. So it's the double uh, double bonus. I would argue that that a case for the Fed cutting rates would be that our dollar is too strong relative to other countries and it's hurting global GDP. And I think one of the things that's clear from the numbers right now is Inflation's slowing, and everyone's happy about that, but growth is slowing around the world, too. You saw it with the numbers out of Europe. China's numbers are slowing. The U.S. had a pop, but that was for the quarter. I think we'll have reasonably good numbers here. I also think the other challenge for a lot of these countries is the demographic problems, which are real, and they're here today. Um, the U.S. has had pretty good immigration right now, but you look at Japan, they were in a negative number again this year. I think South Korea had a positive uh, uh, birth death or a positive population growth rate, modest that it was, but it was the first time in three years they saw growth. Um, so I think there are a lot of factors that we take for granted that um, that work in the U.S.'s favor, and I think immigration is one of them in spite of the insanity that we have for our immigration policies here. So I think, Bill, you're, you're onto something with that, that these nations need a better place to put their money, and the yield differential is enough that it's going to drive it. But I think a 25 basis point cut would take some of the pressure and strains of the, that a strong dollar is creating on the rest of the economy and may give it a little bit of a lift or certainly slow the decline in the growth rate down by using some of that pressure. So I think that's an important element that you're bringing up is nothing is in isolation. It's all uh, the interdependencies of the global economy come through when you see these kind of numbers. Right, absolutely. And, and then just a just a quick reinforcing comment. Um, a, a question a question for the group uh, is that if if I if I told you that I've got an investment that you have to hold it kind of long term, but it's going to give you a hundred x, and it's also liquid. Would you be interested? 
that's that, that's rhetorical. the The answer the answer to that, and um, I, it's on it's on like page thirty three of my Newport in the appendix uh, area. That's that's the seventy thirty portfolio from nineteen seventy five. Uh, through you know through today, so fifty years. If you had a dollar invested in seventy percent S and P and thirty percent what used to be the Lehman aggregate, now the the Bloomberg aggregate bonds. If you just held that for fifty years and did monthly rebalancing, it would probably be more if you didn't do rebalancing. But if you rebalanced it every month. You would have in excess of a hundred dollars today, so a hundred x. Um, clearly, there there are times during the two thousands, in particular, when um, when that wasn't so good, and you had to wait like anywhere between six to eleven years before you got back even, depending upon where you entered in. But nonetheless, the uh, the the power of long term growth in uh, in public equities uh, is 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 not to be dismissed um, at all. Even Nor is the liquidity building. Yeah. Sorry, Stephen, go ahead. Yep. Nor is the liquidity of the public yeah. markets should be underestimated in a rising rate environment or in a higher rate environment that we're in. Um, Mark, I think Giovanni had a question uh, that he wanted to ask. So we'll come back to Rob. And then come back to Rob. Okay. Yeah. Um, Giovanni? I, I get the sense that you don't really believe in modern, mod, modern monetary theory, but if you could bend your mind around to that, uh, if we're not concerned about money being abundant or scarce or so on and so forth, could you comment about the sort of productivity of the government dollar? Do you think that the government dollar is being well spent or poorly spent? given, you know, like the Inflation Reduction Act and, you know, the CHIPS Act and so on and so forth? Uh, I think the I think it was the right idea at the wrong time. Um, we did it. We should have done those acts early in the financial crisis, not at the end of an economic cycle moving into higher rates. But when we were taking rates down to zero is when you would get the most productive spend on that with the lowest cost. Um, but I think the policy that was put in place, I think the intention of the three acts were, uh, well, let me just say, I think giving money to the consumers was not the right thing, just the handouts. I think that was the wrong thing. I think fixing infrastructure is the right thing to do. I think around the world, we have an infrastructure problem that a couple of years ago, McKenzie forecast that we were at $77 trillion short of the required spend that we needed over the next 10 years, and I don't think we've done enough to solve that problem. So I think I think uh, government spending on, on projects that can improve productivity are required, and I think that's important. I think the idea of modern monetary theory, I believe has been debunked by the outcomes that we've seen in places that have tried it, um, that you don't have the, it doesn't solve inequality and it doesn't, um, create a better economic outcome, it just leads to more misallocation of funds. So I think governments generally do not spend money well. I do think the programs you raised, I think defense spending on cybersecurity and all that is essential. I think the infrastructure spend is essential spending. Um, and I think the clean energy transition spend is essential spending. I think the problem with all these things is it starts with an ideological bias, not a economic bias to say what's the right thing that's going to get us the best return on our investment. Um, I also don't believe that uh, we will find success with um, universal uh, uh, guaranteed incomes. Um, I think you have to create the incentives in a system that create people wanting to uh, work and earn and grow and be productive members of society. And I don't think giving money to people does that. Um, so uh, I think that's a long way of answering. I'm not a big fan of, of MMT just to print money. I don't think that works. And I think that the idea that you can print even for the U.S. and not worry about your currency is flawed. I think um, the bill comes due whenever you're overly indebted and, uh, 
And I don't think there's, I think you have to show the financial discipline for the markets to keep coming or else you'll have runaway interest rates and runaway inflation. You won't be able to cover your costs. So I think you have to have control of government spending that is productive and that actually leads to better productivity. I think a lot of the spend from the pandemic that was giveaways did not accomplish any of that. Let's let's keep it going. Other, other, Joel, Rob. Yeah, Rob. Uh, uh, you want me to go, Mark? Point, go uh, ahead. Yeah, okay, thank you. It's Steve. It's it's Rob here. Um, just uh, you mentioned fangs a little bit ago. Um, when do you think um, one of the one of the chip makers, like Nvidia or so, will be part of that, or is that going to happen or not? And then just quick, Mark, shout out. Good job at Newport. It was good to see a number of you all. Rob, I think the fangs are now called the Mag Mega Eight. So they, instead of calling them fangs and jamming in another end, they are now calling it like the Mega Eight. And I think that um, I think that's uh, I think they're here to stay already. I think the question is going to be um, uh, for them is there is going to be their valuation and can somebody come in and be a real competitor to them. There was talk today on NVIDIA that uh, Apple is using an, an Alphabet chip, I believe. Um, but is that really a chip that they're using to replace NVIDIA or is it just a filler? Um, so I think you have real issues there. I, I think they, uh, I, as I said, I don't think the fangs are uh, due for the big correction that everyone's expecting because I think they're pretty uniquely positioned businesses that are really um, essential for the global system. So I think they can play around with their expenses that we were talking about and produce reasonable numbers while they're still making the big investments that other people can't. Um, but I do think the rest of the market can come up closer to and start to see better results as they start to improve, put some of the productivity improvements that the tech sector has afforded them. So, okay. hope that answers your question, Rob. Uh, Joe? Perfect. Yeah, I just I wanted to ask you, Stephen, you talked about fiscal discipline and I can't think of a government over the last 20 years that has been disciplined fiscally and our country doesn't seem to be in that way. So I'm just wondering, with the state of how things are, and what we need to be invested in, what would fiscal discipline actually look like in leadership in our government? That would probably look like 600 and some odd different people in Washington, D.C., <laughs> to be honest with you. I mean, there, there, there's no, there's, there's a, it's very difficult to cut projects out of the core budget that we have. So the real way to do fiscal discipline in, in government would be the way you do it in a company, which you would set up an operating budget, an investment budget. And you would bifurcate the spend that way. So you would keep trying to lower, improve the productivity on your operating budget and make the investment spend like the, like the CHIPS Act and like the uh, National Defense Authorization and some of the infrastructure acts that we're doing um, and try and drive that as investment spend and evaluate it as you would with a return on investment. But governments don't usually do real return on investment kind of analysis, but that's really what we would do if we were running the government. We would create an investment port pool and you'd measure it that way. You'd have a operating pool the way a business or good or a well-run business would do it. But um, you're right, there isn't the discipline, the policies from either party right now will show a complete lack of discipline uh, other than saying we're going to create lower taxes to improve growth or we're going to increase taxes to pay for more things to get a more uh, quality of outcome. Um, and I don't think either one of them is would qualify for what you're saying, Joel. Thank you. You're welcome. Michael. So, um, Stephen, you mentioned cybersecurity, which you know is near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. And I've actually been having discussions with other friends of mine in this space. And the problem is we look at the spend and not the outcomes. And I think that's true in a lot of other areas, right? So we talk about capital spending and government spending. But what we really don't talk about is whether we're getting the returns 
on that spending in improvements in productivity. And so I just kind of question when we have these discussions and throw out statements like, well, government spending's up or, you know, this, that, and the other thing. I, I'm I'm getting more skeptical. Maybe it's just that I'm a cranky old white guy. Um, I, uh, no, I think there's reason to be cranky with, with the way governments operate to begin with. Uh, but Bill put in an interesting comment in the in the chat that, you know, in the U.S. for every dollar spent, you get what, Bill, 43 cents uh, return on that investment. Uh, that's not exactly what would qualify. You wouldn't do that in a corporate environment, right? Um, that you're losing money on your investments. Some of the government investments you have to lose money on. So the, the government's here to help people. They're not here to necessarily be a profit machine, but... You have to get positive spend on it if you're going to keep asking people to either raise their taxes or have fewer services. So you you have to give them a return in some form. So I think the government's been mixed in that. I think the uh, you touched on productivity. We saw productivity go down, uh, kind of the in the pandemic period, and now it's starting to reaccelerate. But if we don't get productivity up in the U.S. and around the world, we're going to have a real problem going forward. Um, so, uh, I think that's really one of the issues and I think it's going to come down to in the U S we have to pull together and stop doing policies that are counterproductive to each other. One of the big advantages that China has is their ability to do programs that can last 10 years or 20 years with the, the expectation of return. Here, when we have election cycles that aren't four years, they're really every two years, it's very difficult to um, get the sustainable uh, traction to move things forward. Uh, because as soon as the election cycle's done, the, uh, the presidential election's done, that guy, uh, that candidate has one year basically to put their signature thing through, and then you start campaigning for the midterms. So you don't really have the sustainability on ideas or on initiatives that you need to get the productive returns that you can in a business or in an autocratic nation. And I think that's one of the things we have to work through. And when you go to some of the European countries and you see the big swings that they're going to have in policy, when you completely reverse policies from, you know, say the uh, conservatives to the Labour Party, does that move the country forward or does it take a step back first before you move the country forward? And then does it last enough long enough to get an election cycle before it's change again? So I think a lot of the productivity comes from the flip-flops of elections as well. So I think those are the problems you have. But I think, Michael, you're on to productivity. And I think the numbers for the U.S. are going to show that we're going to start to see an increase in productivity coming over the next couple of years. And I saw a chart from ISI that says productivity trends go in about 10 year cycles, which means we're about four years into a productivity cycle now. Uh, so Mark has to jump because he's on vacation. So we can take one or two more and then wrap up if that works or we can wrap up. So either way, anyone have any other questions or comments or alternative views? Hey, Stephen, it's Duncan. Yep. Um, I was just going to ask I, I, one comment. First of all, um, if anybody's ever followed the news releases from HM Treasury in the UK, they actually have a pretty good process for a government. Um, it it would be great if we would follow something like that. Um, but um, my, my question is on every time I see these corporate earnings now, it's showing that the sort of the less – well-off portion of the U.S. population is really starting to feel it. I think you see it in car loans. You saw it at McDonald's earnings last week. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, you, you seem pretty constructive on the U.S. market, but there's a whole pretty big piece of the consumer that's really struggling. And I just wonder if you have a thought on how that'll play out. Um, I, yeah, I think the consumer... I think the consumer is very bifurcated in the U.S. And I think the money is with the people who will continue to spend to drive the economy. I think the low-end consumer spends everything they have. They don't save. So their consumption is constant. It's really the middle class that 
is the consumption that's being impacted right now is they're getting squeezed out more and more. Um, so I think that's the area that is where the vulnerability is for businesses, because I think the law and consumer has no discretionary income other than uh, what whatever they have, they basically spend. So they're not saving anything. So it's the middle class that's really being impacted by it. And I think that's where you're seeing a big bifurcation of the have and have nots in the middle class as well. Um, but I think the numbers are so big on the boomers retiring that they're kind of offsetting that with their initial spend. I don't think the boomers will spend at the same rate, particularly if we adjust to a higher level of interest rates that have become more permanent. And they also get over your initial spend of now I have all this time, I'm going to do all this stuff. Then you realize you can't go on vacations every week and do all the kind of service spending that they're doing. So I think there's an element of it that you have to be careful of. But I was focused on that number for the last two years and got um, snookered by the amount of money that um, the people who are in the upper middle class to the really wealthy continue to have and continue to spend. And that bifurcation is really what's driving it. So uh, I think the other element of it is that um, corporations have gone through some pretty difficult times over the last couple of years and have taken some steps to improve their profitability. If, you're, if you've been struggling the last couple of years, you've cut costs. Now you're seeing the larger companies we were talking about earlier, the FANGs, Google was making, Alphabet was making some big cuts. Um, financial services are making big cuts. So a lot of companies are getting more productive than you have the people that are shifting now they're out of work. But at the same time, you're seeing new businesses formation starting pretty aggressively too. So I think there's a lot of puts and takes, Duncan. But I think for me right now, the primary drivers of spending are not the low-end consumer. Um, they spend what they have. It's really the um, upper uh, middle class and higher-end consumer that are going to drive everything for the near term. And then that's backed by the spending by corporations and state and local governments, which I think is still discounted by the markets because they're so focused on the consumer. Which is appropriate for the U.S. because we're a 70% consumer-driven economy, but I think who's driving it, what percent of the 70% they are in terms of income is distorted. So uh, I think they have over 50 some odd percent of the wealth is skewed to the higher end. So that's what's driving things in the near term. How long it goes though, Duncan, is the, the issue. And the other element is um, wage increases aren't necessarily keeping up around the world with cost increases. And that's got to change. You are starting to see some of the retail guys discounting like McDonald's and others starting to bring discounting in because they're feeling that pressure. Um, but other companies don't have to do it. But even in the you look at the video services now and um, the packages that are being put together speak to what your concern is where you're saying like, uh, uh, who is it? The uh, Peacock is uh, aligning with two other firms and Amazon's doing deals with two other guys to lower the cost because if, if you know, all of a sudden you're looking at streaming services at $100, $200 of your monthly costs, not everyone can afford that. So they're starting to lower costs there too. So. I think there are strains in the system, don't get me wrong. I think the U.S. economy relative to others will do better. And I think the U.S. markets relative to others will do better on a risk reward basis. And I think that's the way to look at it. Not that everything's great in the U.S. So, I, yeah, I, I would I would just reinforce by, by saying, you know, what Stephen's been saying a, a long time. And, and the, there's a difference between inflation and the, and the cost of living. And the the impact of inflation on prices is cumulative. So prices are up and they're going to stay up and they're not going to come down until we begin to see deflation. And and that's, you know, right now we're just looking at, at decreases in the rate of inflation. So we're a, we're a long way. And, and I think that, that as those price increases and as the general price level is higher, it's encroaching into ever higher income brackets so that the incremental income that's available for spending is slowly getting wiped out by you know, one cohort after another. And, and I think that that's the marginal impact of that on the upper levels of income, you know, could begin to, you know, we, we're probably seeing signs of that, you know, elsewhere. And that's, that's something that's going to creep up on us if we're not paying attention. 
Yeah, I think you'll, you're, you're seeing the trading down from uh, the higher end consumer already um, in terms of the goods and services that they're buying. Uh, particularly on the good side, you're seeing it in autos, you're seeing it in uh, used car sales, prices are coming down. So you are seeing some pricing coming down from the pandemic highs and some from some of the, you know, some corporations were taking liberties to see what they could get while they could get it with their pricing and see what would stick. And those who can keep them up are going to keep them up and those who need to are adjusting them down. And you are seeing series after series every week, there's announcements of somebody dropping some costs in some places. I think you're seeing it with the amusement parks as well. I think Disney was cutting some of the prices of uh, their deals. You're starting to see more deals coming out. Um, so those are all signs of the concerns that uh, you raised, Duncan, and that Bill highlighted. But I don't think it means we're... Uh, I don't think it's enough to kind of stop some of the other positive stuff that's going on in the markets. Michael. So it's not just on the consumer side when we look at prices. So I've been looking at putting in several miles of fence at our farm and wooden posts for the fencing. Before the pandemic, they were like 10 bucks. Now they're 15 bucks. When you're talking over miles of fencing, that adds up a lot. Plus the cost of field fencing is up significantly, you know? And so it's like, okay, how long does it take me to get a return on that investment? Yeah, I think lumber, you know, you, you highlighted it. Uh, lumber costs spiked with the uh, pandemic. And they haven't come down as much as they've come down, but they haven't come down as much as uh, the increases that are stuck in the system. So how long does it take to, can you get any of those costs out or how long does it take to get them out? I think is still an issue. And that is the cost of living that Bill just described, Michael, is um, you're not seeing it. You're seeing deflation on lumber, I believe, uh, but you are stuck with the higher costs. And that's what you're dealing with with the fence posts. 50% increase is what you just described over a four-year period, right? Yep. And wages, and, and your pricing and wages haven't kept up, can't keep up with that kind of an increase easily. So that's the puts and, kit and takes that go on. So, but it's easy to be negative. And I think most of the market negativity comes from the politics that we're seeing and and so, and the you know the the real issues that are out there, the wars that are going on, and the cost of living is something that people struggle with every day. Um, but for us, we have to look beyond that and say, well, what's going to drive capital going forward? And for us, I think the things we described are uh, higher corporate profits, lower inflation, and uh, interest rates declining give you a favorable backdrop for equity investing in an economy that um, is doing as well or better than any developed nation. So that's the case that we would make, but it's not going to be, it's going to be really sporty, I think, for the next two months in terms of volatility, and you'll get a lot of head fakes on positive moves up and pullbacks, and you'll still see major market moves on company earnings. And I think that's the other thing to keep in mind is the market is mass volatility because the fangs are so big. Um, but when you have individual moves that have been as great as I've seen in my career on earnings numbers um, for mega cap companies of moving 15 to 20 percent, it's a very highly unusual environment. So you want to be nimble and take advantage of those big swings when you get them because they give you some gifts. 